Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of What's Up Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Alia Albarwani, and I'm a board certified family physician. You can watch Muslim Network TV on Roku TV, Fire TV, Apple TV, and Galaxy 19. You can also catch our live streams almost every day on our website at muslimnetwork.tv and on our YouTube page at youtube.com forward slash Muslim Network. Excuse me, Muslim Network TV. Today we have another exciting episode like we always do, and we're gonna be talking about heart health. A lot of times heart disease is thought to be a man's disease, something that affects primarily men. And I wanna talk about heart disease in a more encompassing way and how it affects women as well. Joining us in that discussion is Dr. Reem Howey. Dr. Howey is a board certified internist and cardiologist at the University of Alabama, University of Alabama in Birmingham. She went to med medical school in Germany and completed her medical training in internal medicine at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio and completed her fellowship in cardiovascular diseases at Metro Health Case Western University, during which she served as chief fellow. She's currently serving as a director of the echocardiography lab, as well as the director of cardio oncology clinic and at the VA hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. She's an assistant professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where she's involved in clinical research in cardio-oncology and cardiac strain imaging. Welcome, Dr. Howie. It's such a pleasure to have you on our show today. Thank you, Anya. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. You are a very busy woman. You have so many hats, mashallah, and so we're just really excited to have you and talk about this um, really broad and wide encompassing topic that hopefully we can, we can get quite a few gems off of you today. Yeah, there's certainly a lot to talk about. Of course. So as I mentioned in my intro, I, I feel like a lot of the times when we think about heart attack and heart disease, we have this mental image of a man clutching his chest. But in fact, heart disease affects women as well. And I think that it might be a good way to start off the topic by talking about the incidence of, of heart disease in women and, and kind of the, the variations and how it, we might see it presenting or how, how patients might experience heart disease. Okay, so um, you're starting off with a really interesting topic. And I feel like there were already five questions in that. <laughs> I know, we have, like I said, we have a lot to talk about, so we better get started. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, will, um, I will start off saying that um, uh, not only does heart disease affect women, in fact, one in 16 women does carry diagnosis of heart disease. And uh, in other words, um, or in another statistic, you could say that, when, uh, that heart disease is actually the number one killer for women in the United States for the last four years in a row. Wow. So that by itself tells you that it's actually quite significant and actually, unfortunately, has been underestimated even by the medical community up until, you know, the last decade. Interesting. Very interesting. And would you say that something that I've noticed is a lot of the times I've noticed that women go undiagnosed and that it's only later that we see that on an echo and our EKG, excuse me, that traces of, a, of an old infarct or old MI or a heart attack to put it in simple terms. And so do you, do you think that it has anything to do with the different, the difference in symptoms that women um, experience that might be why the incidence was thought to be lower and why we're now finding that to be higher? Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of things here um, that I think are worth noting. One of them is that the, what you had mentioned is what we typically think of with heart disease is an elephant sitting on your chest. So you get mm -hmm. this, this chest pain, you can't breathe, and you break out a sweat, and that that's when you call 911, and that's when you find out you have a heart attack. Now, it turns out that in about 25% of men, this is actually not the case. Um, and likewise, in about 60% of women, that actually never happens. So they may just feel a little bit- 60% is a lot, that's a good number, goodness. Yes. Yeah, it's a big number, and and I will um, I will say that there there's not that much out there in terms of studies, but the few studies that are out there, even in the Western society, indicate that women typically tend to downplay their symptoms, and they do present to their doctor to their physician with atypical symptoms, and so the physician basically doesn't take it all that serious, and um, which is unfortunate. Now there's a change that has been taken place in the last five years, so now doctors are actually taking women a bit more serious, but I think there is a societal, cultural aspect um, to women kind of being a little bit more 
uh, willing to suffer or like just to kind of toughen it out before they present to a provider. Interesting. And and I I find that really interesting because you're right. It does reflect a lot of our societal and traditional norms where the woman is the caretaker and is responsible for taking care of everybody, sometimes to her own detriment where she's not taking care of herself. And that's really interesting that that trait or feature that's, you know, stereotypically seen in women is reflected in the incidence and uh, of, of heart disease. So that's really, really curious and really interesting. When we think about um, the presenting symptoms, as you said, sometimes they're very subtle in women. And another thing that I want to kind of underline that you stated that I really like is that a lot of times women are not taken seriously by their providers. And that's this can happen, of course, with men. But something I want to plug in here, personally, having experienced this myself as far as being a patient, is being your own advocate. If you feel like something is not right, you, you are the expert on your body, right? And so if you feel like something is not right, if you know how you normally are and something is different, if, if your doctor is not listening to you, my advice to you is find another doctor. <laughs> because a lot of the times when you do find the right doctor, uh, the right, the right uh, you have the, the right experience, you know that you're being taken care of, that can play a lot, uh, play a lot into the care that you receive. And so I know it's not necessarily with respect to heart disease, but a little bit of a side note that I want to share with our audience as far as taking taking ownership of their health. Would you agree? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I could not agree more. And I think the one thing, uh, the one trend actually in medicine that signifies that is what we call personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. So in cardiology, we have found out that a lot of medications that we just prescribe to everybody, they don't actually work on everybody. Um, I mean, it's a little bit of a different spin on the same idea though. I mean, you do, and that's what I tell my patients, you do know yourself the best. So if something doesn't feel right, please just don't disregard it. Please go and see your physician. And if you feel that your provider is not listening to you properly, please go find somebody who does. Excellent. Let's take um, dial it back just a little bit. I think we, we um, jumped into a really interesting topic, but I want to make sure that we define for our audience what heart disease is. There may be some misconceptions or some myths about what that means, whether it's uh, high blood pressure, cholesterol, is that part of what heart disease is, or is it just having a heart attack? Let's take a minute to kind of talk about what encompasses heart disease so that our audience is clear about what we're talking about when we say that. Okay. So um, I absolutely love this question. Traditionally, people, when they think about <laughs> heart disease, they think about that as one entity. And I, I like to, to kind of draw pictures to my patients. So if you think about a house, a house has walls, which I would say is kind of like the heart muscle or the equivalent of the heart muscle. And then there are doors, which is the equivalent of the valves. And then there's electricity in your house, which is the electrical system and your heart beating, basically. And then there is the plumbing of the house, which is the arteries that provide oxygen to your heart muscle. So any of these elements can be actually affected by a disease, and each one of them is a little bit different. So in reality, it's really a range of conditions that are summarized under the simple term of heart disease. So to give you an example, I think um, it's important to know the most common conditions um, in the U.S. are coronary atherosclerosis, which is basically blockage in the heart arteries or, you know, blockage in the plumbing of the heart. Um, and that's like really the most common reason um, that we experience still in the U.S. that typically leads to heart attack, which is obviously a very dramatic presentation, um, which we always see in the TV shows, et cetera. Um, but then there are other things like heart failure, which is basically a weakness of the heart muscle. And that's kind of like, you know, the walls of the house or like the, the muscle is not squeezing enough. Um, and then there are other conditions that you may be born with. Um, there might be infection that affects your heart. Um, so these, these are probably the most common ones that I wanted to mention. I love that imagery that you just described. And I think it's quite funny that I similarly, when I talk about the heart, describe it as a house. <laughs> And we did not like coordinate this ahead of time just for, for the reviewer's sake. But I find it really interesting that we use similar um, analogies to describe that. And the difference that I, the, when I am usually using that, I'm 
confusing a summer is. And so I describe the house, I describe the doors, and I describe the, the valve as the doors. And then I describe the murmur as the drafts in the house where you have either the door doesn't open all the way or it doesn't close all the way. And as you know, air comes by, it makes that noise. <laughs> and so that's how I just, what I use that for uh, describing. So I think it's quite uh, cool that we're both <laughs> using that. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm going to add that to my. <laughs> <laughs> and I will, I will take yours. <laughs> that's excellent. So let's talk about what are some, now that we have a good understanding of what we were talking about when we say heart disease, mm -hmm. let's talk about some risk factors mm -hmm. that uh, our patients or our audience might be, um, might need to consider as far as what would put them at a higher risk for developing heart disease first. And then we'll talk about um, some, some other things later for risk for secondary, et cetera. So let's just start with that. Okay. So um, I would say the, the biggest um, risk factors um, are obesity, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, and um, high cholesterol. Now, if you had like, you know, other unfortunate events like a stroke or a very strong family history, um, those are considered risk factors as well. And then um, one of the big ones is still um, smoking tobacco. Um, even in the era of uh, electronic cigarettes, it's still an issue, actually. Um, so I would say these are probably the biggest risk factors to consider. Interesting. Obesity, you know, I, I talk about this a lot with all my patients. Unfortunately, obesity is just one of those risk factors that you kind of see everywhere. We had a previous episode where we were talking about foot conditions and obesity popped up even there. So it's definitely a problem that we need to address. And it definitely is a an, an issue that, that people should be taking more seriously, in my opinion. When it comes to genetic um, history. You mentioned previous family history for stroke, or I think you said history, genetic uh, family history of stroke, if I'm not mistaken. Are there things, are there specific maybe backgrounds or other genetic um, things that if you know that you have this in your family that you should be aware of and let your doctor know that might put you at a higher risk? Yes. So if you have um, anybody in the family, whether it's your mother, your father, um, brothers um, that had a heart attack under the age of 55, now more in men than in women. So if somebody had like, you know, a, a heart attack at a really young age in your family, that is definitely considered a risk factor. Um, anyone who had a stroke in your family, that is considered a risk factor. And, and there's also some like really unique things. Like if you have a first degree relative that died of um, of unknown reason or like a, a cousin that drowned in, in the pool um, and nobody really knew what happened. Um, those are also red flags because they could actually be a sign of genetic disorders in your electrical system. Um, somebody who collapsed, uh, one of your cousins collapsed on the basketball field, for example, while playing basketball. These are things that are, um, you know, potential indicators of heart disease that you should bring up to your provider. That's some really, really useful information. So really um, what I'm hearing is get to know your family history, get mm -hmm. to know if there are sudden deaths in your family where people are collapsing without any, you know, not, not all the time do we have a clear cause for death in family members, but if that happens, that may be a clue that they had some cardiac issue that they died of. And that's something to keep in mind. And especially at a young age, that's something to mention to your physician. Um, I do want to move into talking about knowing those risk factors. What can we do as um, an individual and what do our physicians do knowing that there is a higher risk factor in terms of preventing heart disease in our patients? But before we do that, we're going to take a short break. You are watching What's Up Doc and this is Muslim Network TV. We'll be back after a few minutes.
don't like them. My name is Adam. You remember me. I appeared in so many episodes that Sound Vision has put on the market. No matter what it oh, no. Hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here. In this lockdown, Sound Vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. We'll have to get back into production again, online and in line. Everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lenisa. Salam! <laughs> Salam! Salam! <laughs> I, know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, let me continue. Uh, this is um, this is what I was going to say. Salam, salam, salam. Cut, cut, cut. <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and the reporter and the... Well, that's enough. Let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith, Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts of my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is Space! Houston, we do not have a problem! <laughs> Salam! See you soon! Welcome back to What's Up Doc and Muslim. We are talking about all things heart related and joining us in that discussion and educating us, Dream Howie. Before the break, we were talking about 
what are some of the things that we can do to prevent heart disease as we were talking about some of the risk factors. But before we jump into even talking about prevention, let's talk about what are some of the signs. We touched on some of the things in the beginning with respect to the differences between men and women, but we didn't really talk about what patients or our audience should be looking for to alert them to possible signs of heart disease. So let's jump into that first. Okay, um, I think this is a very important thing to talk about. Now, we did touch base on the classic one, which is, you know, if you have like this pressure type symptom, this pressure type pain, some something like a brick or an elephant sitting on your chest, mm -hmm. it doesn't get better or worse with breathing, you're adjusting yourself and it's not going anywhere, you definitely need to call 911. And, you know, uh, typically what goes along with that, you'll be breaking out of sweat and you're having a tough time you know, breathing, you feel like you're about to pass out, you feel your heart, heart is pounding. So if that all comes together, uh, uh, do call 911 or have somebody do that for you and present um, to the nearest emergency room. But then there are other more subtle that we in the medical community call atypical um, symptoms. And um, it could be as simple as just feeling a lot more fatigued than your normal baseline. Now, obviously, this could have other reasons. But um, from from the medical perspective, we're trying to rule out, you know, possibly life threatening conditions. So if you feel like suddenly very fatigued, um, then you definitely should bring that up to your uh, physician's atten attention. The other thing is like shortness of breath, um, especially with exertion. Um, so it typically starts um, with exertion, but then can progress and you could start feeling short of breath just sitting there, uh, unable to lie flat at night because you feel you're drowning. Um, having palpitation, meaning that your heart is pounding like crazy. Um, Just to clarify on palpitations, because there are benign or non-serious palpitations that can occur. Can we talk just a little bit more on that or expand on that? Are you talking about the average, my heart just skipped a beat, now I think I'm having a heart attack because of course we're gonna have <laughs> those kinds of people who are really worried and that may, may be worry, worrying them if they hear that. So let's talk a little bit, or if you can just expand a little bit on what um, palpitations are and, and w what you mean by that as far as when to be concerned. Yeah. So I would say um, every time you do feel palpitations, you should bring it up to your physician. That, 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 that definitely does not mean that this is a life-threatening condition. There are, as you said, very benign or you know non, non-dangerous um, palpitation. And what that basically means that you just feel your heartbeats or you, you feel extra heartbeats. Um, about 25% of everyone has um, extra heartbeats. And that by itself is not dangerous or life-threatening. Um, it's some it's somewhat hereditary and it typically goes along with you know episodes in your life where you're like more stressed or you know you sleep deprivation or you change the amount of coffee or caffeine that you know you take in you change the amount of um, tobacco ingestion so um so those can occur and have really not necessarily any like you know bad consequences and then there are the the more malignant arrhythmias um which we typically like worry about a little bit more, um, but that's for us to figure out. So if you do feel that you're having extra heartbeats, um, what we in our community typically would do, we would just like, uh, you know, give you an EKG and then probably do something like a monitor that goes over at least 24 hours, sometimes up to 30 days. And that monitor kind of records all of the heartbeats. And that gives us a better idea of whether your heartbeats are really something not to worry about or something potentially that we have to act on. Um, yes, does that kind of answer your question? Absolutely, that's a very thorough answer. I think you've covered pretty much all, all of the symptoms that I have seen at least as well presenting in the office. And so I always get so nervous when I see shortness of breath or um, chest pain and they've scheduled a routine visit and they're actively having uh, those symptoms. So well, how, what were those symptoms? I always tell my patients, don't wait for an appointment. Call and get in touch with your doctor immediately. If you feel like it's life-threatening, go to the ER. But I don't ever recommend anyone just wait for a new appointment the next day when they're having chest pain or shortness of breath. So that's something to understand and keep in mind. <laughs> The other thing I would say, the other like red flag would be something like lightheadedness, dizziness, or the feeling that you're about to pass out. And that could occur 
either with or without chest pain, or it could happen when you have your extra heartbeats um, or when you feel that your, your chest is pounding, the heart is pounding. Now, if you feel like you're about to pass out, please, yes, um, do, uh, do find your nearest emergency room. You know, even in those, you know, benign rhythm abnormalities, we have patients that are thankfully courageous enough. They just go to the next um, fire station uh, because, you know, um, usually firefighters can at least get us an EKG. And that's maybe the only time that we actually catch that rhythm abnormality. So don't wait around. You'd rather be safe than sorry, especially in this particular instance. So you feel like lightheaded, you're about to pass out, you feel your chest is pounding, go find someone who can give you um, immediate uh, medical attention. Exactly. I love that. Go to your nearest fire station as well, because sometimes those are more easily accessible and scattered throughout a city and an area and even in remote areas where you may not have easy access to a hospital. So thank you for sharing that. That's a gem for sure. <laughs> so let's go back to our original um conversation or thread that we were talking about with the respect to prevention. As we mentioned, sometimes there are things that are beyond our control, such as genetics that put us at higher risk for heart disease. However, some patients think, well, because it runs in my family, there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm just going to eat whatever, whatever I want and, and not take my medications. What do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly an aspect of your genetic makeup that you're just born with and you're stuck with. But that is not the only risk factor for developing heart disease. In fact, I would say about 50% goes into that. The other 50% is really something that you personally can be proactive about. And what I mean by that is, you know, a healthy lifestyle, um, regular exercise, and, you know, um, just avoiding unnecessary, unhealthy habits. Um, and just like to, to kind of give you an example, and that might be more, you know, pertinent to women, but there's actually a study out there in postmenopausal women, meaning like in women above the age of, you know, 55 to 60, um, so they looked at their um, basically their habits and they found if they were eating like three servings of vegetables a day or more, they actually had about a 50 percent less of a plaque burden, meaning there was like less uh, blockage in their arteries of the neck and the brain compared to their counterparts. And that was irrespective of the family history, meaning even if they had a bad family history, they were still better off just by eating healthier compared to their counterparts. And I find that study to be very um, interesting and eye-opening to how much control we actually have over our heart health. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I do believe with any disease, there's always going to be a nature versus nurture component. So the nature of your genetics versus how you nurture and take care of yourself. And so, even though you may be at a slight disadvantage as a result of your family history, you can still control that um, disadvantage. You can reduce the amount of disadvantage that you have. Um, and, and in addition to some of the studies you mentioned, I love reading about twin studies where genetic makeup is almost identical and, and you see differences in disease and dis different diseases based off of lifestyle. And so to let's go down that track and continue to talk about lifestyle because in addition to eating your vegetables, I think that there are other things in our lifestyle, including as you mentioned, smoking and exercise that we can we can control and that can help us with heart disease. So let's let's dive into that. Yeah. So um I think um so the, the way to think about it is really we there's a lot of very complicated lifestyle suggestions out there and there's a lot of fat diets that are always like you know advertised mm -hmm. but i really think it comes down to a very healthy balance in fact you know if you look at some of these fat diets that you know go all against or all for red meat if you look into the data you find that either extreme actually comes with a higher mortality meaning patients not doing very well from a heart health perspective so i think you know um keep in mind whatever you do um always kind of try to strike a very healthy balance because if you go to extreme most of the time you you tend to go the, all the other way. So let's talk about very simple things. I, you know, we talked about smoking. Smoking is a big one. Even patients who have um, established coronary disease, had established bypass surgery, um, who continue to smoke, don't do well. So even the bypasses that we create and the, the treatments actually um, cannot help them and they eventually succumb to heart disease much sooner than, than they should. Um, so like not smoke. Um, 
we think that you know aerobic exercise for about 40 minutes a day um, in the ideal world is something that is definitely linked to a healthier heart. And you know when we think about um, aerobic exercise, you know for younger patients this might be something very easy to achieve. Um, but um, it could be something as simple in the older population as walking through a very large store like you know Walmart or Home Depot. Um, so you're not you know you don't have to go to a fancy you know, a fancy like gym or, you know, you're not like necessarily prone to like very hot or very cold weather and then you're stuck at home. That's so it could be just like, you know, a fast walk and where you get your heart rate up a little bit. Um, so that's something that I'd say is a little bit more realistic than, you know, just signing up for a gym and all, you know, the only thing that's losing weight or, you know, cholesterol is really your wallet and, and nothing else and you never go. I always tell my patients to actually leave their wallet or their purse in the car <laughs> and go to an indoor mall and walk laps. That uh -huh. way the only they're they're only gaining, you know, from the exercise and they don't even even their wallets are safe. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Yeah, and, and then just to add on to that, um, I do agree we don't have to pay into a membership, a gym membership to get good aerobic exercise. Even thinking about going to your local high school and a lot of times they allow outsiders to use the track and just walking using the track at your local school mm -hmm. sometimes that can be enough to get your heart pumping just like you said mm -hmm. but um I, i'm sorry to interrupt you i'll let you continue no absolutely and i i mean we do live in the time of a pandemic at this point so i think we have to be a little more creative because traditionally exactly. we we suggest to find peers that you walk with or peers that you know you enjoy like a similar type of physical activity you know you may not be able to do this at this point anymore more. But there's plenty of resources even online on YouTube, whether it's something like yoga, whether it's something like, you know, just, you know, regular cardio fitness um, that is accessible for free. And, you know, um, and I think it's very beneficial and something that's realistic that you can incorporate in your lifestyle at your time, at your own time. I love it. All of such valuable information that we're sharing here today. Thank you, Dr. Howie. We are going to take a quick little break here. You are watching What's Up Doc on Muslim Network TV, and we'll be back after a brief break. My wife, who uh, she's a professor at the University of Cincinnati, who, who's Catholic, and by her watching and listening to our three-year-old son uh, watch Adam's World, she end up taking Kalima Shahada. She embraced Islam because she learned so much about Islam and the other prophets. It really affected our life in a great way. And because of uh, sound vision and Adam's world, we're Muslims. I took my Shahada 15 years ago, and I actually am from a rural part of Ohio. And so I found the catalog for sound vision and I ordered the the tapes and the CDs and the books, and I use those, and especially for my little daughter, you know, that's how we basically learned our Islam and Islam entered our hearts through the wonderful works of, of Sound Vision. Okay, Assalamu alaikum, brother. I just want you to know that I love the Sound Vision website, that a lot of times when I'm looking for information, especially as it relates to homelessness, domestic violence, and women issues, I go to that website, and then I see what you've written, and then I copy and paste it, and spread the word, because the wisdom is there, so I can't you know, I can't do any better than what Sound Vision has already done. Sound Vision is our survival uh, uh, guide. It is the uh, organization that provides skills for Muslims how to survive and thrive in this uh, community here in the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Anam, I'm in 11th grade and I grew up with Adam's World and what it taught me was unity, respect and love for the Muslim Ummah. Is Adam's World is the greatest show ever made. Take me to the Kaaba, man. I love that puppet. Assalamu alaikum everyone, it's your brother Zain Bika from South Africa. One of the first educational programs ever produced for Muslim children was the ever popular Adam's World series. The colorful and comical Muslim puppets stole the heart of a generation. Sound Vision will be releasing brand new episodes of Adam's World with the launch of a Adam's World app. 
Subscribers will enjoy new Adam's World episodes as they are released, as well as all the classic episodes of Adam's World. So visit adamsworldapp.com now to learn more, subscribe and enjoy new adventures of Adam and his friends. And let's keep helping tomorrow's Muslims today. Assalamu alaikum. Adam's World. Believe me, there's a lot to see. Bismillah. Let's explore. Welcome back. You are watching What's Up Doc here on Muslim Network TV. And today we are talking about heart disease. Joining us in that discussion is Dr. Reem Howie. And so Dr. Howie, we've been talking about a lot of really important information for our audience as far as symptoms and prevention and uh, things like that as far as heart disease is concerned. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about any spe specific or special populations that should particularly be worried about heart disease. Some big ones we mentioned earlier are high blood pressure patients as well as diabetics, but um, that, that list also includes pregnant women and patients with cancer. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yes, I'm really glad you're bringing up this question. Um, I think uh, sometimes we are very unaware of, uh, of conditions, especially around pregnancy. So um, pregnant women who develop suddenly headaches or swelling in their legs, um, which is obviously not uncommon. But if it gets out of hand, they definitely should bring it up to their um, gynecologist or obstetrician. Um, they are very familiar with these conditions. Um, if you suddenly um, become short of breath during your pregnancy, um, those types of things definitely should be brought up to, um, to a physician's attention. A lot of times, it is actually during pregnancy that we find out about, you know, congenital valve disease, meaning, you know, heart conditions that you are actually born with, uh, but were just never picked up on. So that is certainly one. Um, uh, the other, um, the other big symptoms during pregnancy to watch out for is definitely sudden chest pain. Um, it's uh, it's actually not uncommon for pregnant patients to develop heart attacks, and those do present with a typical chest pain. Do not put it off please go and see someone about that. Um, now, there are other conditions that are very specific to women, you know, um, especially after menopause. Uh, women before menopause um, do have that hormone called estrogen in, in their body that is thought to be very protective um, from building up plaques in your arteries. And yes. postmenopausal, you do not... Um, actually uh, make that hormone anymore, uh, which is linked to higher uh, occurrence of heart disease at that point. Um, now, you might think that with hormone replacement therapy that, you know, um, some patients actually do take estrogen to mm -hmm. uh, basically counteract that, that it would help with heart disease, but it turns out it actually does not and, in fact, can cause mm -hmm. more heart attacks and more clots to happen. Um, I think which that... Brings, which 
uh, sorry to interrupt, but that brings as 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 a family physician who's having to sometimes manage um, patients who have heart disease that start on hormone therapy and being sometimes I'm the one to catch that because patients are not telling their OBGYN provider that they have heart disease. And so un unknowingly they get started on, on that without maybe clearing it with their cardiologist. And so that's a great point that you bring up. Yeah, and then um, last but not least, um, any patient who has cancer should definitely talk with their um, cancer specialist about the risk of heart disease. So uh, fortunately, um, we have come a long way in treating cancer. So our patients are, with cancer are living longer. So just as a part of aging, they develop heart disease. But some of these um, very um, curative and helpful cancer treatments actually have heart side effects, um, meaning um, specifically, I would like to mention Dr. Rubison because most cancer patients tend to know their medications very well. So if you are on that medication, you wanna make sure that you get checked out by a, um, by a heart doctor at least once, um, as um, some of these cancer treatments do come with a very high burden of um, cardiac side effects. That is really, really very important information especially as you said, because patients who are on cancer treatments do know their medication. So that's really important to know if you are not seeing a heart doctor to definitely follow up with one. Mm -hmm. Along those lines, when we talk about uh, really going to see your cardiologist to check in if you are on that medication, in the broader sense, personally, I have, I recommend patients who really when they get to mid to late 20s, to start going to come in to come in to get your yearly physical exams, uh, and a lot of the times people don't know to come in for that because they think that everything is fine, and so if they have no symptoms, then everything is good. Which unfortunately we know that is not true because under the hood there is a lot happening that is building up over time, um, or I guess in the basement in our analogy of the house that there's there are things cooking in the basement you may not be aware of, and so it's really important to make sure that you're coming in to see maybe starting with you if you don't have a known history of heart disease coming into your fam family medicine's office to get an annual exam, which usually includes blood work, which we can kind of look at some risk factors there, screen for diabetes, high cholesterol, checking your blood pressure as well, because all of those are risk factors as well as Dr. Howie mentioned. One Another thing that I also noticed, Dr. Howie, is a lot of patients be, uh, along the lines of, you know, I feel fine, so everything is good, is with respect to their diabetes and high blood pressure, which we, of course, know has a very high risk and um, uh, considered e equivalent to having a pr previous MI um, with respect to diabetes as a risk factor for, for other, um, other things, other bad diseases. People call high blood pressure a silent killer. For obvious reasons, the name is implied that patients are feeling okay until they're not. And with diabetes, similarly, depending on how high their blood sugars are, they can feel just fine until they're not. What do you tell your patients or how do you recommend care for patients who, who say this or patients who have high blood pressure and diabetes, which we see so often? Yeah, so I think this, um, this concept of hypertension being the silent killer is, is a really powerful image. So I tell my patients that, you know, especially the ones that came uh, come in with a heart attack and they wake up and they say, well, I was fine until last month. I typically respond to that. No, you were probably not. So it takes about 10 years for a blockage to build. So that blockage didn't pop up overnight. That heart attack didn't just happen out of the blue. So I think starting in your mid 20s is actually the biggest favor you can do for yourself to make sure that you're actually, you know, A, do you have any of these diseases? Do you have any of these silent killers like high blood pressure or diabetes? And if you don't, great, check in next year. But if you do, um, are you doing your very best to keep those under control? Because even patients who do have high blood pressure, who are taking the medications and whose blood pressure is well controlled, now those do about five times better compared to their counterparts who um, are not taking this serious. So it does take a long time for these diseases to build up. And once you're stuck with them, they don't really go away even if your heart attack was fixed. And it does not mean that you can now stop 
taking your medicines or, you know, uh, go back to smoking. It really only means, well, you got lucky once. Make sure, you know, you keep on top of your health and, you know, you don't drop that in the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Just straight, straight to the point. Absolutely. Something that I hear a lot from our patients are two things that I want to talk about before we wrap up here. One thing that I hear from patients is this hesitancy after we've talked about, you know, prevention, signs, symptoms, et cetera. Once you have heart disease or have been diagnosed with one after you've had a heart attack or um, heart failure, or diagnosed with that rather, patients are very hesitant to get back to exercising. We talked about exercise with respect to prevention, but let's talk a little bit about how how after some something that has happened to you, um, such as, as I mentioned, with a heart failure or, or a heart attack, mm -hmm. if it's safe to go back, when should patients return? And I know this is very patient dependent, but in the broader sense, our is exercise still something that our patients can go back to after having something like this? Absolutely. And, and you know, if you think about it philosophically, that's really the goal of treating our patients. So um, there, there is like this old belief and like 20 years ago, we would keep our patients who had a heart attack for weeks um, on bed rest. Bed rest, yes. Yeah. And I think a lot of that kind of is transpiring in this traditional belief in the, you know, in the lay population that you really need to rest. But we do, we are, we're a lot smarter now than we were back then. And we know that actually the sooner you get out of bed and the sooner you build up that stamina, uh, the better you will do in the long run. Now, you may not be able to run a marathon right after a heart attack. You, you probably will feel tired and you know you, you may not be up to do much, but this is something that you can start building back up on really fairly quickly. Now, depending on what type of condition you have, you know, you want to check back with your cardiologist and see if you want to be part of one of these supervised exercise programs that we call cardiac rehab. Um, but I will say 50% of my patients just go back to, you know, walking and then, you know, build up themselves uh, unless there's a really specific condition. But we do know that um, patients after heart attacks and after heart failure who go back on the treadmill or who do some regular exercise, they feel better. Um, they feel better from a depression standpoint. They feel better from a heart standpoint. They live longer and they live better. I love that. That's that's really important. Cardiac rehab. There is definitely re exercise that will help. All exercise really helps the heart. And as you mentioned, gradually building that up is what's important. Um, and I, 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 I agree with you. I always, even when they come in to see me, ask them to get cleared by their car cardiologist first before they do, they do that, just to be safe. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, what I was just referring to is probably the majority of our patients, but there will be specific cases and that might be either like a valve issue or mm -hmm. an electrical issue or something in particular in your anatomy mm -hmm. that may um, that may make it safer to wait. And that's really for your cardiologist to decide. So that's definitely a good point. And it also points to the communication between your family physician and your subspecialist, I think, um, you know, they need to be on the same page and um, that should certainly help guide your way to recovery. Absolutely. A hundred and I agree with you a hundred percent. Before we wrap up this episode, gosh, we could keep talking, but I really want to talk about supplements. I hear this a lot. Patients want to know what kind of supplements they can take to help with their heart health. There are some, there's some evidence about the benefits of vitamin D, CoQ enzyme. Um, and so what do, you, what do you say to that if your patients ask you about supplements? Um, so that is a very interesting topic. And we certainly live in a, in, a, in a time and age where you go in the store and you have like all these supplements selling you these ideas. Um, now, I will say um, there's two in particular, the ones that you are mentioned that I would like to talk about. And one of them is vitamin D. Uh, and the other one is um, CoQ10. And I also would like to touch base on vitamin E. So um, there is evidence that patients who lack vitamin D have more heart disease, but we do not know if it actually causes heart disease. In fact, patients who lack vitamin D, unfortunately, um, tend to be also more obese, uh, don't tend to um, exercise as much. They also tend to have more diabetes. So we think that it's those three 
that might be the reason those people And if I can add, um, Dr. Howie, in yeah. my personal experience, it's a lot of minorities as well. And, and it's, it's curious yeah. if it's because of lack, you know, the having more pigmented skin and the inability to really absorb vitamin D from, mm -hmm. um, um, so sources from the sun versus as opposed to dietary intake because of malnutrition. So I, I don't know which one is really contributing to that, but I do notice a trend with my minority patients with the low vitamin D as well. Um, that is actually uh, an interesting point that you're making. There are some very small studies, observational studies that, in, in this, the one that I'm quoting in particular looks at Mediterranean descent uh, population, and those tend to actually need higher levels of vitamin D compared to their, you know, Western counterparts. Uh, we don't understand this very well. Interesting. But just an, I, the matter of sun exposure, or as you said, something in their metabolism, but there might be certainly racial differences in how much we actually need and how much we are able to absorb. Mm -hmm. So that's certainly, um, that might be part of it. Okay. However, there are pretty solid, there's pretty solid data that taking excessive amounts of vitamin D can actually cause heart conditions. Um, oh gosh, <laughs> which goes back to what you said about the two extremes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, you know, um, you're not going to prevent heart disease, at least to our knowledge at this point, by just taking vitamin D um, supplements in excess. Um, now for CoQ10, I will say that we have some data that patients with heart failure, actually their symptoms improve and their heart function improves with CoQ10. The data is not solid, and um, what that means that there might be some benefit, but you definitely need to talk to your physician um, about it if you are considering to take it. And the reason you want to, one of the reasons you want to talk to your physician about it is because you are on a lot of other medications if you have a heart condition. And unfortunately, those supplements interact with some of the medications that you're on. And as an example, I'm going to give you blood thinners. So a lot of our patients with, with heart conditions are on blood thinners. And if you take CoQ10, you'll never be able to achieve adequate amount of blood thinning um, because these medication actually, medications actually work against each other. So um, those are the nuances that you kind of want to watch out for and discuss with your physician before you decide to take any supplement. I just, I feel like we can keep talking, but unfortunately our show has come to an end. We have covered quite a bit of information. I think that we were able to cover a lot in this um, episode and to share a lot of really important information with our audience. So I thank you so much, Dr. Howie, for your time and your knowledge, and we wish you every success. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Abawani. It was really a pleasure, and I'm really um, excited to be part of this. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on another episode of What's Up, Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Abawani, and you can watch this along with all of our other episodes on our YouTube page at youtube.com forward slash Muslim Network TV. Today, we talked with Dr. Howie about a lot of heart related conditions, and we hope that we provided a lot of useful information to you. I hope I'll, t I hope I'll get to see you again on another episode of What's Up, Doc. Until then, I'll see you next time. <laughs>